أكبر الله أكبر الله أكبر ولله الحمد. Hello everyone and welcome to conversations about beauty and Islamic theology. And today we're very very honoured to host Professor Christian Gruber. Just to give a very brief introduction, Pr Professor Christian Gruber is Chair and Professor of Islamic Art, and Islamic Art in the History of Art Department at the University of Michigan Ann Arbor. Her primary field of interest is Islamic book arts, paintings of the Prophet Muhammad, and Islamic ascension texts and images, about which she has written three books and edited several volumes of articles. She also pursues research in Islamic book arts and code ecology, having authored the online catalogue of Islamic calligraphies in the Library of Congress, as well as edited the volume of articles entitled The Islamic Manuscript Tradition. Her most recent publications include her book, The Praiseworthy One, The Prophet Muhammad in Islamic Texts and Images, and her edited volume, The Image Debate, Figural Representation in Islam and Across the World, both published in 2019. Professor Christian Gruber, Professor Christian Gruber welcome. Thank you so much, Bilal. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. So I thought I would start by asking uh, it's kind of a broad question because you've published so widely on Islamic representations of the Prophet Muhammad. So I thought you could perhaps speak to us very briefly about what led you to this field of study and perhaps give us a general idea of what these representations may look like. Like with all things, I think you land on subjects, not just willfully, but haphazardly. Um, and for me, it was a, a long trajectory. Uh, the way I got to the subject of images of the prophet was actually by focusing on illustrated manuscripts of the Miraj, the ascension of the prophet Muhammad, because I'm interested in code ecology, so in uh, Islamic book arts, and also in the biography of the prophet and apocalyptics. So I was combining a code ecology with Islamic studies. I ended up writing my dissertation on uh, Miraj Namez or Kitab al-Miraj, right? So books of the prophet Muhammad's ascension. And I was just very interested to understand how that, that miracle was narrated and illustrated uh, throughout uh, the centuries, particularly in, in uh, Persian and Turkish uh, spheres. And then as I was looking at all the paintings that accompanied uh, this bio apocalypse, I realized that depictions of the Prophet Muhammad himself changed over time within the context of, of these types of works. And so little by little over the course of over a decade or even a dozen years, I was collecting these images from many other types of sources. And that's what led eventually to first a pilot piece, um, an article in the journal Mukarnas, and then I let that macerate at a, a very low boil for, for about a decade. And then a, a, a book came out. But it was a, a, a matter of looking at narrations of a, a miracle that's also an apocalypse and really paying attention to the images and realizing that there was a trajectory for devotional images of the Prophet Muhammad beyond the, that genre of, of works. So that's how I got to the topic. It wasn't direct. It was through my first two books, really. Right. And what, what kind of, I mean, you've spoken about the Miraj Nami, what, what, does the, what do the representations look like? Are they so, just paintings of him or are there other kinds of uh, representation? There are various representations in the Miraj Nami, in the Books of Ascension. It basically follows Muhammad from the time that he's awoken uh, by the angel Gabriel and told that he's going to embark on a, a night journey and ascension through the skies until the time he makes it all the way back to Mecca. And so the typical tale, even though the, the details vary widely from one book to another, uh, depict uh, or narrate Muhammad going from Mecca to Jerusalem, uh, typically on the back of his human headed winged and flying uh, steed known as Al Burak. And then in Jerusalem, he prays with other prophets. He becomes the imam, the prayer leader. So the, the leader of previous Judeo-Christian prophets. And then that's from, from Jerusalem. That's when he sort of hops through the skies. Um, and there he encounters many other prophets, angels of different demeanors, shapes, and sizes. He crosses different mountains and seas. Um, eventually, he gets to see heaven and hell. Um, and then he bargains that through Moses for the five daily prayers as he communicates directly with God. And then the tale ends differently in different places. Sometimes it ends with Mount Cuff, uh, 
with the prophet uh, converting a Jewish community at Mount Kaf, which is uh, at the end of the world, or alternatively returning uh, to Mecca via Jerusalem, seeing some things on the way. And then once he's back in Mecca, he's able to tell Abu Jahl, his lifelong enemy, of what uh, happened. And therefore, it became a, a verifying uh, feature of the veracity of the miracle of the night ascension itself. Uh, some of the earliest tales say that the followers of the prophet actually apostatized from Islam based on what they heard about the Miraj. But then later on, uh, most of them, when they hear about the miracle, convert over uh, to, to the faith. So eventually it became kind of a miraculous conversion tale, even though that wasn't always the case early on. That's fascinating. Um, I think one of the really uh, interesting things about your work is that uh, texts like the Mitraj number and also some of the other representations that you look at, you really look at these representations of the, as the site of multiple layers of meaning. There's like the visual realm, but you also explore the sensory realm um, through to the kind of metaphysical and symbolic aspects of these of these representations. And you, in, in many times, you kind of relate these things to contemporaneous theological trends, historical trends, political trends. And so I was wondering if you could speak to us uh, about these kinds of multiple layers that a piece may have had, um, especially the sensory realm, which is like a really fascinating one. I would encourage everyone to read Professor Gruber's um, article, The Rose of the Prophet Muhammad, which really explores a, a number of these realms in, in conjunction. Yeah, no, you're right. What uh, drew, drew me really to the idea of the sensorium, in other words, the contemplation, imagination, and understanding of the prophet beyond the realm of the imagination was the fact that if you spend a lot of time looking at these images, you'll see that the artists were incredibly intelligent and sophisticated philosophers in their own right. So for example, you may have images of, the Muhammad, of Muhammad with a facial veil. You may have an image of the prophet Muhammad whose face has been replaced by a flaming nimbus, a golden flame. Or you may have an image of Muhammad as a, a pink rose. These are not accidental. It's not haphazard that you find a rose or a veil or light uh, emerging out of the prophet. These are all related to philo philosophical musings on the nature, the metaphysical nature, the ontology of the prophet Muhammad over time. Uh, frequently they overlap with Sufi uh, or more spiritualized ways of, of understanding and uh, grasping the prophet Muhammad. And they're not just about skirting uh, veristic imagery either. So for example, if we talk about the senses here, Images of the Prophet Muhammad sometimes represent him with a facial veil. So you don't see his feature, his features. And there's a lot in Persian poetry about uh, the sacred being uh, secreted behind a, a, a perde or a hijab, right? Behind a, a firmament or a curtain. God's own ipseity is unseen to the human eye. It's not graspable to the human uh, mind. And so in terms of the, the senses here, what the artist is forcing you to do or to become is to become blind. He's disallowing you of the visual sense when it comes to actually grasping the prophet. You have to grasp Muhammad through non-visual capacities, including through uh, poesis or the, the imagination of, of the ear when you hear poetry and not the eye. And that happens in the image. And that's kind of ironic when you think about it. It's paradoxical that an image would challenge you to go beyond visuality, but that's what artists did uh, in terms of the, the, sense, the sensory capacities and, and camouflages. So that's one example. And then you mentioned the, the Rose of the Prophet or Gulle Muhammad or Gulle Muhammad in Ottoman and Persian. And there, that's also not haphazard. The prophet Muhammad was often referred to with the word gul or gol, which means both pink and rose. So you've got color symbolism. Muhammad was thought of as a conjunction between the red of humanity, so a blood clot, a real human being, red being the color of human blood um, and our, our lifeblood and the white light of divine creation, the so-called nur Muhammad or the light of Muhammad. So you've got white light with blood red fusing into pink. So Muhammad is seen as that inter-substance between humanity 
and sacrality. He's not considered sacred. He's, of course, a man. He is Ummi, but he actually is a conjunction between those two realms. So the, the color pink uh, is very important, as is the metaphor of the rose, because that activates actually the olfactory realm, your capacity for smell or scent. And Muhammad is often described uh, not in physical terms, although you do have literature describing his physique, his characteristics, but as a scent. So Persian poetry, Ottoman poetry, describe Muhammad as sweet smelling like a rose. Um, and in fact, the smell of the rose, like rose water or rose perfume lasts almost forever, even when the rose dies. And so that became a metaphor for Muhammad. He trickles through his sweet prophetic aroma through the generations, even though his physical self has long ceased to be. So the smell of the rose, this beautiful entity continues to percolate um, through the ages, just like say the prophecy of Muhammad touching uh, his believers. So that's another really beautiful metaphor that activates uh, the olfactory sense. And then of course, you've got the Nuri Muhammad or light of Muhammad, and that activates heat as well. Um, and what is fascinating about nur or light is that you see it, you know it's there, but it's not tactilic, you can't touch it, you can't grab it. It's, it's immaterial and yet it's present. So that also describes Muhammad as something that enlightens his people, that brings warmth, that is absolutely present in many ways, but not necessarily in a material physical way in a postmortem um, capacity. So these are all very complex, uh, beautiful multi-sensorial ways that artists and philosophers and poets are uh, used to imagine the prophet. And you see all those motifs carry over to the pictorial arts as well. That's really fascinating because it kind of relates to how one can have spiritual union with, or some form of spiritual union with the prophet Muhammad through objects, right? And mm -hmm. through this kind of sensory as well as imaginative experience that you describe. And on that note, I, I wanted to talk to you about these Hilya bottles. Uh, and, I, and I have to tell you, I'll just um, share an image here of the, uh, the Hilya bottles just so people can see. When, when I first saw uh, these Hilya bottles, it was announced in like a talk that you were giving. As a calligraphy geek, I was so <laughs> excited <laughs> in, at, in anticipation of your talk or it was like, how I was waiting for the Lord of the Rings trilogy, I was, you know, because I'd never seen any, I, of course I'd studied Hilliers, but I'd never seen anything like this before. Um, so perhaps you could speak to us about how you found these objects, what you thought and what you think they um, represent. Sure, yeah. Um, so that talk is up online. It, uh, it was a talk I gave at Harvard this past year. And again, this was just one of those fortuitous events. I wasn't looking for them. I didn't even know they existed. But uh, I've been working in the Topkapi Palace Manuscript Library now since uh, 2004. So we're talking 17 years of research. And uh, the head curator, Zeynep uh, Atbash Chilik, and I, of course, uh, had, had been working for a long time together. And she knew exactly what I was interested in, in researching, in devotional materials to the prophet. And she said, I've got to bring something out for you that uh, is going to kind of boggle your mind because I didn't know what to do with these when I did my show on Ashkenebi, on uh, Love of the Prophet, the show at Topkapı. So I didn't really bring them out. So the next thing I know, I'm in a manuscript library and these enormous glass bottles are coming out. They're not even supposed to be in the manuscript stacks. They're glass bottles. So two things don't belong. So suddenly I have in front of me in a manuscript reading room, very large glasses with Helias nestled within them and Zainab simply said these are really strange I don't know what to do with them you should write an article I said all right let's do that <laughs> so I became fascinated by them as with anything you don't know you just have to spend a lot of time with that person or with the object so that their whole personality can reveal themselves to you slowly and so with an object like that you have to look really carefully and then you realize that you can rock the heliers when you rock them, it scrapes the side of the bottles and the, the, the side has inscriptions sometimes in gold 
ink that says Nur Muhammad, and then you realize actually that maybe you can get some of that gold dust out of the bottle. And if you're supposed to get some of the gold dust out of the bottle, then what are you supposed to do with that gold dust? And then you start looking at pharmacopoeia, um, elixirs, potions that were made in the Topkapi Palace, um, uh, apok uh, in the pharmacy there. And you realize actually that the sultans in particular uh, were ingesting maybe gold, gold precipitate that was mixed into sherbet or zamzam water or potions that were functioning as curals. And I became utterly fascinated by this because it meant beyond all of the different devotions to the Prophet Muhammad that I knew about, uh, that now I had to actually account for another sense, which was the gustatory sense or ingestion, um, that in a way you could imbibe or ingest the essence uh, of a prophetic precipitate and, and in, enact your inner Muhammad, that the Prophet Muhammad could in fact almost somatically fuse with the body of the faithful. And so we've got a different type of, of a metaphorical Muhammad in these glass bottles, um, something that it's a prophet that can become quite literally part of you through metaphorical um, materialisms uh, as well. So that article on the Helia bottles is now out in, in Turkish and it should be out in Arabic translation sometime uh, later this year. Fantastic. Does it does that relate to any of the other uh, experiences or or rituals surrounding some of the other relics in the Top Kappa uh, collection? Yeah, absolutely. So there are footprints of the Prophet in Top Kappa, and his mantle is also uh, there in the relics chamber. And at least once a year, there was a ritual washing of the footprints and the mantle, and the water runoff wasn't discarded. It was actually stored in vials. Um, to be imbibed either to break the fast during the month of Ramadan or um, to help somebody that was sick in the palace. So it was seen as a prophetic uh, cure-all, uh, the water runoff. Uh, additionally, the, the Helia bottles seem to be offshoots of icon bottles from uh, Christian sacred springs in Constantinople. Um, so you see many springs, uh, spring churches. There are quite a few churches in Constantinople and Istanbul that have holy springs below them. And still today, um, Christians, Muslims, atheists, tourists go into these holy springs. They gather water. Typically the water bottle will have an icon of Mary or Christ on it. Um, and then individual, individuals will then imbibe that sacred water to, to help them with various illnesses or the, if they can't conceive um, so this isn't just about Islam or Christianity. This is age old belief systems linked to the, the healing potential of water. Um, so that's where the, the bottle comes in, but the sort of a bottling of an icon seems to be particularly indebted to the Christian Holy Springs of Constantinople to which Muslim devotees started to also pay pilgrimage. And then you see these bottles transforming from an actual figural icon of Jesus Christ to a verbal icon of the Prophet Muhammad. Absolutely fascinating. Thanks so much for sharing that uh, with us, Professor Gruber. Um, you, you spoke earlier about the idea of a, an artist as philosopher. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to get more of an idea from you as to the kind of intersections between theology and art or the production of material culture, because there is this kind of big, there is this kind of big gap, I guess, in our knowledge of we have all of this kind of theological thinking going on and then we have all this kind of material production but we don't really have these texts or theoretical texts at least that can really link the two together that doesn't seem to be something which is produced in 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 the islamic world um so i wanted to get your ideas on that i mean to what extent do you think there is an intersection between theology and the production of material culture and how does that work you know what kind of frameworks can we use to understand this relationship better so, you know, I've been really interested to see how Shahab Ahmed tackles that in his book, you know, What is Islam? And often he invites us to transcend the, the legalistic doctrinaire approach uh, to Islam by looking at say paintings or, or music or poetry and wine drinking and these things. Um, and it's true that there is quite um, a substantial um, 
doctrinal apparatus that we can turn to the Sunnah, we can turn to theology, and there are plenty, there's a very rich textual reservoir for Islam there. The question though becomes, well, what about those topics where there isn't very much writing, but there's another form of evidence, which is material visual. And so in the absence of articulated doctrine, something that doesn't exist therefore that we can't transcend, right? As Shahab Ahmed says, what do we do in, in an absence or in a lacuna? Uh, what we can do is look at the non-textual evidence. And so if you are to engage with say material culture or with visuality on its own terms, you will see that that uh, corpus of evidentiary data articulates a doctrine in and of itself in the absence of a textual articulation. So for example, if you look at the corpus of especially Persian depictions, and here I use depictions with flying quotation marks of God, you'll notice that painters are actually articulating for themselves a theology of the unseen in their painterly ways. How do you try to hint that God is present in this painting without resorting to crude anthropocentrisms? Uh, you might show just his right hand, right? Because that might be a reference to Yedallah and that we know that, that that's articulated in, in theology. Uh, you might represent him as a, a bundle of flames. So God as a, a quintessential light, a light that is pre-eternal and post-eternal. How do you represent pre and post-eternity? Perhaps you fill up the whole page from right to left or bottom to top to suggest uh, the monumentality of the temporal dimensions of an amorphous God. That would be another technique you could use. Um, or you could use, you know, sort of poetic uh, symbolism around, again, color symbolism, like blue, for example. Blue is the firmament, firmament, it's the skies, it's God as well. So if you spend a lot of time looking at those images, you realize that in an unspoken way, but in a very clear visual lexicon, they're articulating a theology, or at least a theological form of, of speculative imagination in visual shape. And so it's, it's, it's an invitation, not only for Shahab Ahmed to transcend the legalistic doctrinaire approach, but to transcend language itself, to transcend our logocentrism when it comes to understanding theology and large ontological concerns like what is divinity or what is even time, what is being. That's a very, that's really interesting because it, it relates to this idea of art as theology or some kind of um, theological aesthetic that works can do something that discourse can't perhaps you know that looking at a work of art can lead you somewhere lead to conclusions about god or existence or cosmogony which some kind of you know written book could never do yeah and uh, of course uh emic to the islamic tradition is that god is beautiful and he loves beauty right and, and so the question is well what is what is beauty what is aesthetics and how does that intersect with ethics? Um, and a number of art historians and philosophers have talked about uh, uh, aesthetic ethics or ethical aesthetics, you know, that which is beautiful is also good. That's a very old Hellenistic tradition, what, kalos kakos, what is beautiful, what is not beautiful. And so when you look at paintings, you have to also ask yourself, if this, supposed, is, this, if this is supposed to represent God, then it's supposed to represent beauty and goodness. And therefore, how can we use this data to articulate also a theology of aesthetics, given the emic forms of expression that we find within that pictorial language without having to rely on Eurocentric articulations of art history, which say, you know, it, art, you know artistic traditions developed into, you know, three-dimensional perspective and then there was a renaissance and art became beautiful and not flat. This is not the case for, for the Islamic tradition. We have a whole other aesthetic system that's, that's at play and that can't be explained away through traditional art historical methods or, or any other tradition that's um, sort of indigenous, let's say, to, to the European tradition. So it's important to jump out of that. Perhaps uh, I can just ask you to expand on this idea of beauty a little bit more and then maybe speak about some of the aesthetic values that you encountered in your work or 
some of the emic notions of beauty, uh, perhaps that you've um, discovered in the Islamic tradition? Mm -hmm. So, in terms of beauty, of course, you've got the, the term Jamal, right, uh, which is uh, the most frequently used term for, for beauty. And a couple of scholars, including uh, uh, Doris Behrens Abu Saif, have, have written entire books on beauty and notions of beauty in Islam. Um, also, Valerie Gonzalez has a book on that subject. And they look a lot to Ghazali and, and other thinkers about what constitutes uh, beauty. You do have notions of uh, harmony, right? So mizan, a, a balance, a balance of shapes, a balance of forms, a balance of being. Uh, that could be related also to humor uh, theory. So your humors have to be in, in balance um, so that uh, you are not then uh, as a human being made corrupt by outside elements, um, including pestilential ones. So harmony is important, balance is important, uh, sort of a unity of being is quite important, especially if you're looking at Sufi traditions. So a painting or any material that's visual has to be seen as united that, uh, in its, its composition. That some scholars have said is related to the notion of Tawheed or a unicity uh, in Islam, that there's a oneness of being uh, of God and, and all of his creatures. Uh, that they're inseparable and indivisible. And in the end, it creates one total picture, right? Uh, so I like to think of the picture as a cosmos as well. So you have notions of, of balance and harmony and composition that are from within the Islamic tradition, whether you're looking uh, at, at Sufi or not. Uh, it all depends on the context. You can pinpoint um, and, and more upon different landings uh, to, to decide what corpus is most appropriate for what you're studying. But I think those are sort of the, the really promising venues and there's a lot more work to be done uh, in that field. Professor, as a, uh, a final question just related to this um, idea of beauty, one of the conversations we've had on this series is with, we, we spoke to um, Valerie Gonzalez um, also, um, but with Professor uh, Cyrus Ali Zargar, who authored this book on Sufi aesthetics. Um, and he focused on Ibn Arabi and uh, Al-Iraqi. And then we spoke about this idea of Shahid Bazi. Mm -hmm. You know, this idea that gazing upon the, on the beautiful form of the human being, like a, typically like a beardless youth, can lead one to the divine because the divine is a low, the, the beautiful youth can be like a loci for divine manifestation, right? Mm -hmm. And so some people are actually engaged in this practice of gazing at youth and finding some kind of hidden beauty uh, of God within that. And we spoke about the potential of this um, and how it may have influenced the production of material culture, especially figural painting. And since you work on kind of figural representation and, and especially on depictions of the Prophet Muhammad um, and other kind of dignitaries, I was wondering whether any ideas emerge in your research where the human form really is accentuated or articulated as a loci for divine manifestation, whether this perhaps changes the way these figures are depicted or represented. Now, it's interesting that you mentioned the gaze because that, that is another really important element in these paintings. Um, so the notion of nazar or nazar in Ottoman Turkish, you see nazar in Ottoman Turkish quite a lot um, for depictions of Muhammad's uh, seal, his seal of prophethood. Um, and so, for example, there are these Ottoman prayer books where you've got the seal of the prophet represented. And in the margin, it says, make sure that you, you look upon this blessed seal, and the term is nazar, in the morning or in the night, you know. And so there's a rhythm of looking, and it's not just glancing, it's deep, thoughtful, uh, diving into the visuality. So it's a diving gaze. Uh, like almost a drowning in, into the image itself. So the gaze is as an absorption or flooding of the eyes of an external figure. But the point with that you often see in the text is that it's, it's not just an optical looking, uh, so a view of the basar of the eyeball. In the end, the, the ruya or the vision has to be of the, the heart. So you've got ruya al basar, so the, the seeing of the eyeball, which is uh, something that's very literate uh, or literal. And then you've got ruyat al kalb or the seeing by the heart, which is a metaphorical seeing or understanding. And the trick there, when you're looking at, at a painting, 
is to grasp it in its complex totality visually through the bussar, through the eyeball. But then that image has to go from, from picture to picturation, from image to imagination, from the eyeball to the heart. It has to be internalized and metaphorized in order to activate a different arena of obsidian of being for the Prophet Muhammad. And only then have you arrived at the, at the next state of contemplation, which is revelation or transcendence or actual understanding, ma'rifah, Gnostic knowledge of something that's otherwise unseen and ungraspable. So it's a, a two-step process. And the second step is the hardest to, to reach because it's not literal. Um, it's more complex and cogitative and devotional. Would you say that there's parallels then between this kind of, from this movement from form to imagination with uh, Islamic poetry? Mm. I think it mimics um, uh, many different strategies of poetry because in, in the end, poetry is sounds that are words that are strung together. But in the end, when they're strung together, they create uh, metaphors that are um, figures of speech. And, and it's interesting to me to think about speech as a figure, right? A figure of speech is a metaphor, an allegory, or an, an ally, a simile, whatever. This is like something else. In other words, a metaphor is, an un, is, is a yoking of two things that are not the same. Speech is not a figure, and a figure is not a mental contemplation, and yet these are being yoked, tethered together. And it's up to the human to be smart enough, um, to be um, complex enough in his or her cerebral uh, landscape to go from point A to point B and to hook those two things together. And you do that in poetry, you, you hook the literal with the metaphorical and the same kind of pattern holds across the visual arts. You have to hook the visual with the, with the visuality, with the contemplation as well. So it's, it's a challenge to go from, uh, from pure contemplation or pure seeing to actual understanding, ma'adifat. That takes practice, I think. For the I think for the believers, it took a lot of time and practice. Um, incubation, right, istikhara, or, or uh, plenty of maceration in one's own cognitive state. Well, I guess this highlights the kind of links between mysticism and, and art too, right? That both of them require this kind of transition from form through the imagination to some kind of higher plane. Uh, mm -hmm. Professor Gruber, uh, I know I said that it was my last question, but you, when you said that you were in Istanbul, um, I thought I, I, I would just ask you because you have published as well on some of the kind of contemporary uh, articulations of, of traditional Turkish art. Um, and I just wanted to get your opinion that now we've got this kind of really big revival of traditional art, especially in the last uh, two decades in Istanbul. So, so many of these traditional forms like calligraphy, Ebru, Tezhib, and uh, miniature painting are coming to the fore. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to know, based on your kind of um, experience, do you think that some of these ideas are still there? Or do you think that with the kind of advent of modernity, it's been a huge kind of cut and we have to really separate the study of traditional art that is produ being produced in the contemporary world from that which was produced in the past? I think that there was a, a big cut, especially for Turkey in the 1920s. Um, you know, there was an abandonment of the Arabic script, a secularization of the state. So the cut was very severe and it, it was there, but it was never lost. So when we talk about the revival of the calligraphic arts or illumination, for example, uh, in Turkey in particular, it, it draws on a very rich reservoir of, of Ottoman art that was always there and always was surviving, even though there was a, a turn away from it uh, during and after Atatürk. So despite the cut um, and the shying away from those traditional art forms in order to uh, you know, tip the hat to modernity and all of the baggage that, that came with conceptualizations of modernity, um, calligraphy was still there. It's still in Üsküdar. You can go to workshops. Um, you can still get an ijaza as an Arabic script calligrapher uh, here with the masters of, of Istanbul. Um, there are other masters that have fanned out um, including in Washington, DC. 
So I think um, there's been definitely an uptick in the traditional arts uh, of Islam in the last couple of decades. Uh, I think that has to do with many different uh, twists and turns of culture and politics today, depending on where you're located. It's not the same in Iran as it is in Egypt or Morocco or, or Turkey. Uh, but there is an inward looking that there is the notion that modernity need not shy away from tradition, uh, that sometimes the most modern thing, for example, preserving the environment might be the most um, long lasting um, and time honored as well. So those two things are not uh, mutually exclusive. And I think individuals have come to terms with that notion as well. Rosa Gruber, thank you so much for your time. We're so jealous that you're in Istanbul and in Ramadan, which is like a really fun, <laughs> blessed time. Um, thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom. And uh, we wish you all the best uh, in your time in Istanbul. Um, is there anything that you can uh, tell us about your future research plans just before we say goodbye? Sure, yeah. First, you know, blessed Ramadan to you and your family. Um, and um, my next uh, research is um, on Ottoman microarchitectural birdhouses. That should go up online in the next week or two. So it's about thinking of architecture as a place for the survival and thriving of the avian species. Um, I'm looking a lot at sort of environmental arts. Um, the arts of endangerment and, and persecution also. I'm working on archeological photography. I have a, a volume coming out on archeological photography, photography in the next couple of months. And keep your eyes open in the next uh, two weeks, uh, three essays of mine on the healing arts of Islam will come out in Ajam uh, so to coincide with, with Ramadan as well. So uh, I talk about Zamzam water and talismanic shirts and uh, medicinal bowls and amulets that are anti-plague amulets. So I'm, I'm looking at all sorts of different subjects, um, depending on what is happening at any given moment or, or you know, where the publishers stand in their backlog and their production schedule. <laughs> Usually, you know, other people make those determinations for you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you so we're very excited to read that especially those uh, Ajam articles thank you so much Professor Gruber thank you so much for your time thank you thank you for having me Bilal thank you